Welcome to the Great Loop Radio podcast, brought to you by America's Great Loop Cruisers Association. We're dedicated to sharing Great Loop information and inspiration with those actively cruising, planning for, or dreaming about a Great Loop adventure. I'm Kim Russo. I'm the director of AGLCA. Today, we're going to talk about the Gulf crossing, and I know there are many loopers still waiting to cross the Gulf this season. We're going to cover You Make the Call, which is an effort from some of our amazing volunteers to help our members identify the best weather window for their own Gulf crossing. So our guests today will be David Fuller and Sally Bentley. They have been both been guests before separately. Um, they're frequent speakers for AGLCA. Um, and Dave is really kind of the powerhouse behind the You Make the Call daily report. And Sally has been assisting with that by providing some of the details. So we will dig into all of that in just a moment. First, I do want to take a moment to recognize and thank our Admiral sponsors who support AGLCA at the highest level. They are Curtis Stokes & Associates, Great Loop Yacht Sales, Passage Maker Trawler Fest, Skipper Bob Publications, and Waterway Guide Media. As always, we encourage our listeners and viewers to support these businesses that support the Great Loop. And now on to the topic at hand. I'd like to more officially welcome Dave and Solly to Great Loop Radio. Thanks for joining me today, gentlemen. Glad to be here. Happy to be here. Yeah, we appreciate you. We can tell that, Dave, you're coming to us from your RV home in Texas visiting. Um, so enjoy that family time. And Sally, of course, you can tell he is aboard, um, awaiting the weather window for his own golf crossing on this, his second loop. So uh, we've kind of got an all-star cast here for you today. Um, for those of you who, who don't know, AGLCA's volunteers kind of have a history of assisting other members to identify that good weather window. And it started probably 20 years ago when Tom Conrad did his weather musings. He kind of passed the baton to Eddie Johnson, who has done the weather wag. And this year, um, Dave Fuller very graciously picked up that baton and ran with it and um, did his own take on that, which is a really uh, extensive take. <laughs> and we appreciate David for that and Sally for assisting him with it. Um, but let's kind of start from the beginning, why is it that you think, David, that so many loopers feel such angst when they start to think about the Gulf crossing? Well, I think we all have experience uh, in our non-boating life where we've created some kind of big outdoor party or have some activity and the weather has at the last minute, last second, has crashed the party in a not too good way. So I think that's a common experience that we all have so when we get ready to cross this gulf in the back of our head i think we're always thinking is this weather really going to hold or is something going to go wrong and, you know i just think that's a universal experience that we all have so. i think i agree with that 100 percent. i also because it is kind of the the longest um offshore crossing on the great loop um and for slower boats, that has generally been presented as it means an overnight crossing. Uh, but one of the things we're going to talk about in this session is that it really doesn't have to be. And there's kind of multiple ways to attack this. Um, and as I said, the, the reports, Dave, that you're providing daily are really extensive. Um, and I think the first thing I said to you when you approached me with this idea was, are you sure you want to do all of this? <laughs> I think it kind of started a little smaller. And I said, just as long as people understand that we're not approaching A, B, and C, we're just approaching D. And Dave said, oh, well, then I'll do A, B, and C too. So we thank you for that. And I think everyone has learned a lot from this because I mentioned some of the past cast of characters who have done this for us. Um, and they tend to, to focus on the straight across golf crossing, basically um, Carabell to Tarpon Springs or Clearwater. It's 170 statute miles doing it that way, roughly. And that is an overnight crossing for slower boats. But Dave, you have kind of taken on the idea that this doesn't have to, that's not the only way to do it. So we'll talk more about that as we jump in. Um, but what made you decide, you know, the the weather wag um, was not happening this year. Eddie was, is, was enjoying a few, well, several weeks down under, um, which made it kind of impossible to ask him to put out weather reports <laughs> for back here. Um, and you jumped in and said, well, I can do this. Um, why did you think it was important to have that resource available to people? Well, I think, uh, you know, I started hearing rumors at the uh, fall rendezvous that it wasn't going to, the Eddie's weather wag wasn't going to happen. 
And so in the back of my mind, I started thinking about, you know, how could we fill the gap? And, you know, to your first question about that angst that we all seem to have about crossing it, and, you know, I've told the story at the rendezvous before about some friends of ours that she put herself in the hospital for being so worried about it. And I just know that there is a lot of, you know, trepidation and angst. And without Eddie's weather wag there, I just felt like uh, that was a huge gap. And, you know, I, I thought I could close the gap and help our fellow boaters out. So uh, the more I thought about it, the more I convinced myself it was the right thing to do. And kind of put down a, a rough plan and shot that to you to see if you, what you thought about it. And then it is what it is. <laughs> and it's been a great re resource. Lots of members have been hugely thankful and very complimentary for what you're putting together. Um, what's the biggest surprise that you learned after you kind of started putting together this report on a daily basis? The, uh, you know, we, as you said before, you know, Tom Conrad kind of predates me, but I think he had the same idea about going across. It seemed to be a rite of passage to do the overnight crossing mm -hmm. and uh, to be in the, you know, to be in the AGLCA. A uh, couple of years ago, though, Eddie's got some elderly parents, him and Linda both. And so you asked me to do that Gulf Crossing uh, presentation during the COVID time. And when I did that presentation, the thing that dawned on me is that it going around the Big Bend doesn't get a lot of press. And you hear, the thing that I hear all the time was, well, you got to have three or four days good weather to do that. And when you look at, you know, the, the, the weather, you never see three or four days in a row that you can really get across. But those weather reports are really for going across, not going around. And so the biggest surprise to me is, is that there seems to be more windows of opportunity to cross, you know, to move around the bend and there is to actually cross straight over. And I think today's a great example for tomorrow. Uh, I think people are going to be moving. You, you know, there were boats moving today uh, going from Carabell up to St. Mark's, St. Mark's to, to Steenhaddy. And, and because of that north, northeast wind, the, the coast actually protects you. And I think there's actually Interesting enough, there's probably you can move more often around the bend than you can straight across. And that is super interesting and not something that we really have collected a lot of data about because uh, you're right that the straight across crossing has been kind of viewed as a rite of passage. Um, and it is Tom Conrad from years ago and Eddie's preferred way of doing the crossing. So that's what they focused on. Um, I, I think you're the first one, David, who is willing to take on the multiple different ways of crossing, <laughs> um, which has led us to have, you know, some more details on how many suitable weather windows there are. Instead of banking the big hop straight across the 170 miles, you can take smaller hops around the big bend. Um, and you're right, you know, the, the kind of conventional wisdom has been, oh, well, then you need three good weather days. But in that small little pocket of the Gulf, the weather can be pretty vastly different. Um, Sally, you also mentioned that you were surprised by uh, some things as you were kind of helping with this, uh, you make the call. Um, particularly, you know, AJLCA recommends that boats have a go, no, no, go, excuse me, a go or no go criteria. And Sally, you were mentioned some surprise in, in how other loopers were handling that. I was, Kim. And the fact that we've just, uh, we just spent a month in Panama City Beach uh, at a Bay Point marina there and you're you're constantly talking to other loopers up and down the dock and, and at dock tails and so the, almost the second question after how long are you going to be here is is when are you crossing and so i usually ask you know what is your what is your go no go criteria and i'm just flabbergasted sometimes of the of the number of loopers that don't have a go or no go criteria um, ours is uh, mile per hour winds, two foot seas, uh, period ratio of two. And so everything that I'm looking at is based on that criteria. But to talk to other loopers, um, they don't they don't seem to just go as far as to have that criteria. I think it's just if they're looking outside and it looks windy, they may not go. But that's, I, I think, such the the great opportunity that they have looking at David's uh, document. It's educational, and so not only is it not only is it the days of the weather, but by reading that first page that David has, you learn 
about how to possibly make your go no go criteria. And I think that's very important. I agree. It's important. And I think, you know, I think some boats avoid doing it because every crew is different and every boat handles the water different. So, you know, you, uh, Solly, have your main ship 400. And, you know, as an example, you've been around the loop one time and are on your second. So you've got a little bit more experience with how that boat handles than perhaps another crew who just started out on their main ship 400. So uh, where I'm going with that is the go, no go criteria um, can be hard to establish until you've experienced some conditions you didn't like <laughs> and then can say, well, that's a no-go for us the next time. Um, but that said, the fact that, you know, you're including three different boats, three very different boats in the report is super helpful. Well, and, and I think going back to the no-go uh, criteria, it I don't think it necessarily is related to experience on a boat. I think it's your exposure to elements. And so I may be, you know, I may have a criteria, of maybe 10 mile per hour winds, 12 or 15, but then all of a sudden I'm out and I see 17 or maybe I see 14 and I'm thinking, you know, 14 is the most I want to do. So I, I think it's your exposure to different situations that helps you build that no go, uh, go criteria. Yeah, especially I think after, you know, it can be a perfectly gorgeous sunny day and you can be on inland waters. And until you try to dock the boat in a 25 mile an hour <laughs> wind, you might think the wind has very little to do with it. So, yeah, it does take some getting out there and experiencing it. Um, so there's three different boats included in You Make the Call, the daily report. So, Dave, why don't you kind of explain what that's about? You know, we, we kind of talked about Solly's as the main ship 400, but there's two other boats there, one being yours. And, you know, what led to you to, to set it up that way? Well, I know, you know, again, you know, kind of what Solly said about you walking the docks when you're on that panhandle and talking to folks, you know, everybody's boat is different. And uh, I remember it's been several years ago now, maybe 21 or 22, I don't remember, but there was a group of boats that went over, went across the nighttime crossing. They had 50 foot boats all the way to a 26 foot boat. And I remember that little 26 Rossberg, they went over in five foot seas. And the P, there were two 55 foot boats in that flotilla. And for the, the people that went across, that was no big deal in that 55 foot boat. You know, they were, in fact, the guy, Roger, the guy that was kind of leading that group, he grew up on the Pacific Ocean. And, and I, he used to tell me, yeah, if I didn't go out in five foot seas, I never went boating. And, you know, so it's all about experience, right? But that little 26 foot boat, can't handle what that big 55 foot boat is and so i really wanted to to kind of break it down and as you know i've got a, a dear friend captain Don, dan and mary on that we we cross with them on a 26 foot uh uh little tug a nordic tug and so you know our criteria was much different than theirs the second time we went across and so trying to get all of my experience and so that's why one of those boats is a 50 footer that's ours at the top the main ship 400 is one of the most popular boats on the loop. So it makes great sense to get that boat in there, you know, and Solly was gracious enough to help out. And then the tug, the Ranger tug, I think it, you, you probably know better than me, but I think the tug is the, that Ranger tug is like the number three boat, popular boat on the, on the loop currently. So that's kind of why I picked that one, but you know, it gets the, the cut waters and some of those smaller boats and gives them a, an idea of what's going on there too. Right. We're not all in a big boat. Right. So that first page kind of uh, lays the groundwork, so to speak, for those three boats. Each boat's go, no go criteria based on wind speed, wave heights, wave period. Um, you know, really helpful kind of benchmarks, even though everyone needs to determine what their own comfort level is for different conditions. Um, it's a great place to start. Um, it also kind of lists the weather resources each of you use. So why don't uh, both of you tell us which weather resources you use to try and monitor the forecasts for a suitable crossing window? Go ahead, Sully. Okay. Um, I start out with sail flow. Uh, I found it's very easy, uh, almost a little bit to me. The more you get into it, the more self-explanatory it is. But I start with sail flow. I'll look at several destinations, and then I'll immediately go over to Wendy, as we refer to Wendy the Blue app, because there's another app as well. So um, I'll come. I'll use those back and forth. And then looking at long range, I'll use MARVs. Uh, I think what's also great on this, um, what Dave has brought together on You Make the Call, 
is not only do we have different boats, but we're looking at different apps as well. And and I always find it entertaining because David and I will talk uh, prior to uh, him posting, you make the call. And sometimes we we slightly disagree depending on what apps we may be looking at. So you have to understand your app for sure. And, uh, and I, it's one of the things that I do is, I mean, I go through and I put all these data points on a piece of paper. So I, I go through my apps, I look at it, I compare each other, and uh, and then I'm sending the information over to David to post. Yeah. And Dave, what, what do you use? So I, I start a little bit different, kind of backwards from, from Solly there, but I start with Mars because I just like the way it's presented. It's eye candy to me. So I look at that and, you know, if it's 20 miles an hour, I don't bother looking any further. <laughs> and so it could be a pretty quick day, you know, but but I like to use Mars first because I just like the way it's pictorial presented. If it looks marginal or it looks like it's good to go, then I'll use the uh, I, I like to use cell flow, but I knew Solly liked to use that also. So I was trying to see what the differences would be. So I started using the marine the marine weather there and then i'm using passage weather that's on online uh, instead of really an app but it's just trying to get those different ideas to see if if in fact we would come up with the same answers or not and i kind of like the fact that we don't always get the right answers and it makes people have to think then when they're looking at it whoa, whoa what's going on here and as, as solly said it's all of those apps massage that data just a little bit differently and it'll give you different answers which is go to make a point here is I think what, you know, Sully talked about the go, no go criteria is that you really need to get that for your boat. If you don't have one, use these that are here and then adjust it as you go. But the, with your own experience, but the real thing is, is not to go shopping for the answer you want. So I know there's 20 something boats in Carabell right now. And in a day or two, it's going to be maybe marginal to go across. We'll see what happens when we get there. But a lot of people are going to want to go, and so they're going to shop for the answer they want. And you you can find the answer you want. It may <laughs> not be what you want when you get out there. So, uh, so you know, stick to your criteria. Use the same apps all the time. Get used to those apps. And if it's, you know, if they're not agreeing or if they're kind of something's going on different between them, it's probably because the weather's not cooperating and they just are massaging that data a little different. So I would stay put. Yeah. You know, one thing um, that becomes hard to avoid when you're waiting for that weather window is what I kind of call trying to thread the needle on a certain number of hours instead of days that looks good. Um, and, and Sally, I know you have some thoughts on that about how long of a window you actually need. So talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so many times you just look at the window, but depending on the seas prior to the window, if they're pretty rough, you got to allow some time for those seas to flatten out a little bit going into that window that you have. And I think that was the great thing that Eddie Johnson always emphasized was that you needed to have you needed to have that buffer at the beginning for the calm seas and then also have that buffer at the end just in case that weather pattern is changing and is approaching quicker. So I, I definitely the buffer on both sides is very important. Yeah, we actually, um, I think, as you both know, we did our crossing a little over a week ago now, I guess. I don't recall the exact date. Um, we kind of knew we were threading the needle a little bit. Um, and thanks to the long range forecast that you kind of include as a data point in the daily you make the call. We knew it was kind of that then or, or probably not for another at least 10 days. So there were many boats out there. Um, I, you know, I loved it. <laughs> I think I am one of the few who loved that night. Um, but I kind of felt like, first of all, uh, our buddy boats and us are faster boats. So daylight only was our agreed upon method of doing the crossing. But when it came down to it, the overnight hours were going to have better weather. Um, so we we got to do the overnight, which I didn't think I really wanted to do, but that part of it was absolutely magical. We saw shooting stars, we saw bioluminescence, we saw these neon glowing um, jellyfish just under the surface. It was truly amazing. Um, but as the sun came up, uh, the conditions started to worsen, which was kind of expected. Um, they worsened probably a little bit more than we expected. But for the first time in my entire life, I took a seasick medicine medication that worked. <laughs> so we were sitting there in three and four, probably three and four foot swells. 
and I was not sick. And it was the craziest experience for me because I have never not been sick in much smaller weight. So I was enjoying it and everybody else was like, oh my gosh, when is this going to end? And I was like, this is great. Um, <laughs> but the other thing that I had never known um, and was kind of interesting to me was we altered course a little bit. And uh, we, in addition, uh, we, we started every day with you make the call and then looked at some of the weather apps ourselves. Um, probably agree more and our size boat is closer to Solly's than Dave's, um, but probably agree more with Solly's conservative uh, choosings uh, <laughs> than Dave's on most of those. Um, but because we were faster boats also, uh, we kind of, and we're now looking at doing it overnight, even though that wasn't the plan. And um, we brought in Chris Parker's Marine Weather Service, which is a paid service. He is an AGLCA sponsor and gives a discount, but his suggestion, knowing all of our parameters, you know, our boat speeds, my tendency towards seasickness. And he said, you can do this. Um, go towards Cedar Key, which is kind of one of the stops on the Big Bend. But he said, don't go right from Dog Island off of Carabelle towards Clearwater. Go towards Cedar Key and then turn towards towards uh, Clearwater at first light, um, which is what we did. We still had the three to four footers that a lot of others saw, but the others who went straight across left earlier than us because they were slower boats and experience on their route, the three and four foot seas much sooner than we did, which was curious to me because I really didn't know that that small route alteration could really make that big of a difference. It seems to have based on others telling us, oh, we started to see those three and four footers at 1 a.m. We saw them about 7 a.m. So uh, just an interesting thought for people who are, ideally, you're not trying to thread the needle like that, where you know you've got a few hours. Um, and hopefully the crossing windows that are coming up are not going to be like that. But um, seasickness was my biggest fear about the crossing, and it all turned out fine. So I'm happy to have that under my belt. And it was a source of angst strictly for that. I was fortunate that our buddy boat and Michael here aboard the perch had all done two crossings before. So I was kind of the only newbie in the group. So I got the full experience though, by doing the overnight. So it was kind of fun. Um, but aside from that, um, you know, the, I overn the overnight ahead. is the overnight is fun. Uh, when, when you've got the great weather window and you've got as common seas as you can possibly go on the overnight is, is special. And I think the people who may have some anxiousness about it, if the weather window's there, I encourage it to go overnight because, again, it's what you see out there, the horizon, the stars and everything. Uh, we set the boat on autopilot and Jackie went out and I sat on the bow for several hours during the night. So uh, don't rule out an overnight just just because you might be anxious about it. If you got a weather window, go for it. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with that more. Um, so we talked about the fact that we are a go fast boat and our plan had been to do a daylight only crossing. Um, and that's something that Eddie hasn't really covered much in the weather wag because he is a go slow boat and he covers his method of crossing the Gulf. But Dave, you decided to include that. So tell us a little bit about, you know, kind of the parameters for a daylight only crossing. How does that differ from overnight? All right. So uh, that, the way that report's set up is, I think Solly mentioned, kind of the first page is general information. So the kind of going across fast is kind of page two of that document. Mm -hmm. We have the criteria and a table set up. And underneath that's so kind of a blue table that has speeds. Kind of the idea is to get over to Carabell, I mean, leaving Carabell, so that you arrive over in Tarpon Springs at the R red marker four at the north end there of Tarpon Springs around uh, four o'clock in the afternoon. So that way you can get docked. So you're not docking in the dark. Right. And with this, this time of year, you're going to have 10, 10 and a half hours of daylight. And so I put a table in there with five different speeds and you kind of have to go 17 miles an hour as a minimum to, to get across, to leave Carabelle, to arrive in Tarpon Springs in truly all daylight conditions. Uh, but it gives it, you know, if you're a little slower than that, you can still do it. Uh, just another strategy that people use, and we've done this, is when you're, if on the day you travel towards Carabelle from Apalachicola, go out to that red four marker and then turn around and go back to Carabelle, but do a track all the way to your dock. And then if you have to leave in the morning, if you're going at 15 miles an hour, maybe 13 miles an hour, 
you can leave earlier in the morning at dark, but you can follow your track out. And by the time you get out there, the sun will start be coming up pretty quick. And so, yeah, you're in the dark a little bit, but you can still get across mm -hmm. with enough speed to make it by four o'clock in the afternoon in the dark. I mean, in dock in the, in the light, not the dark. So yeah. uh, that's kind of the idea behind that. And then in addition to the table that kind of go, goes over the speed at which you might travel and the, you know, the time you need to leave and arrive, um, you give a little bit of the details of what you're seeing um, in the weather apps as possible conditions. Correct. Right. Yeah. So if you look on there, it gives our criteria. So, you know, mine's a little different. I think Saul, you said yours is 12, two and two. So we go at 15 miles an hour and just a caution. A lot of those apps, you're going to look at 15, but watch those apps because they might be saying knots and not miles per hour. So, so just a, a heads up on that, but ours is 15 miles per hour. Uh, and then two foot seas, and then that same thing with the period and the wave height is, uh, you know, two to one ratio. You want that that uh, time between waves to be twice as much as that wave height. So uh, so we kind of go with that. Uh, Solly does, as he mentioned, the, the main ship 400. And then for that little tug, we've dropped that down. I called a friend that has actually has a tug, and, and that's those are his criteria for his boat when they cross. You see that 10 miles an hour, one foot wave. So it's, it's kind of where that comes from. And and uh, we try to apply that criteria for the different apps and would we go or not go. Yeah. And of course, it's called you make the call because everyone has to make this call on their own. Um, <laughs> you know, even when the go, no go decision to me is most helpful in preventing you from going when you shouldn't just because you're getting eager to get to the other side. Um, but you can always wait for better conditions than your go, no go says. So, um, you know, it, it is a really helpful benchmark to have that. Um, and then for those who either can't maintain the speed that's needed for a daylight only crossing or those who perhaps just don't wanna burn that much fuel getting from point A to point B, um, there is kind of the traditional rite of passage, so to speak, overnight crossing, which is what the weather wag and Tom's weather musings focused on for all those years which is probably part of what created that as kind of a rite of passage, um, so to speak. And, and, you know, this is for the people who want that overnight experience um, that I so thoroughly and unexpectedly got to enjoy. So page three kind of covers that overnight crossing. So what's the advantage, um, you know, anything we didn't share about doing it overnight or any of the details about that crossing plan that's on page three of your daily report? Well, you know, I think you mentioned, you know, just the beauty of it. We don't get to see the, the, with so much light pollution normally, you just don't get 40 miles offshore where there is no light. And if you go across and on a non cloudy day with the stars and seeing the Milky Way, you mentioned other things, it, it is an absolute, you know, gorgeous trip across. Mm -hmm. it, if, if the weather is good. So, I mean, it, it is kind of magical. I, you know, you described it that way. I think that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, and so, and again, you know, uh, you're going to go across slow. You're going to save a lot of money on fuel. Right. And, and 170 <laughs> miles, that adds up fast. Yeah, absolutely does. And, and so planning wise, you want to be um, a certain distance from your destination, likely Tarpon Springs or Clearwater. Um, in the daylight because you'll start to come across those crab pots. So, you know, what kind of hours, how many hours are we talking about that people with an overnight crossing might need in order to complete it? Yeah. So if you look on that, there's again, a table on that page. And so it's, you'll see over there, arrive at that same R4 marker and it says 10 AM and that 10 AM arrival point is to your point, Kim, is to make sure that the sun is up because you are going to start seeing those crab pots. 20, 30 miles out. And so that gets the sun up off the horizon. So you're not looking in directly into the sun and uh, getting a glare. So that's kind of what that's all predicated on. And so you can see on that table of, of what times to leave. Uh, I kind of look uh, when I'm doing this uh, for the weather, it's kind of 3 p.m., you know, to leave in the afternoon and then get over there at 10. And I'm watching that window. Solly mentioned earlier about, you know, looking 12 hours ahead before you leave and 12 hours after. Uh, our first crossing in 2016, it was supposed to, the people that went across daylight, it was like glass, they said. So we were thinking, all right, this is going to be great. We started untying the lines 
And all of a sudden the wind picked up and it's like, well, that's not in the forecast. <laughs> so we looked at the weather apps and it still wasn't in the forecast. And we said, well, we're going anyway. There were four of us. And by the time we got out to, to the R, R2 marker there at Dog Island, out East Pass, it was two and three foot waves already. And I, where did this come from? Mm -hmm. What happened to those severe, flat, smooth seas? And of course, we convinced ourselves to go anyway, and it stayed two to three foot seas till midnight before it finally settled down. Mm -hmm. And uh, so to, to that point is there is no shame in turning around. If you stick your nose out and it's not meeting your conditions, there's no shame in turning that boat around and going back into the dock. Absolutely none. So, you know, and, and a, a lot of the people who have really taken an interest in the Gulf crossing weather and helping others like you and like Eddie Johnson uh, started with a not so not so great crossing <laughs> and decided to take that experience and first, you know, first of all, fix that for their next crossing, but also use that knowledge to help others. So the rest of us certainly appreciate it. Um, and, you know, the overnight crossing at different speeds. Um, as I said, we left um, we left Dog Island at 9 p.m. Other boats had left all throughout the day, throughout the afternoon. Um so our, our approach was just a little bit different based on our speed. Um, and that seems to have been a difference maker as well. And, and I'll, I'll make fun of my, my bride and first class passenger. So we crossed the first time. It was like 17 hours across. In our boat, we can speed up and slow down. So we can go 20 knots. So when it gets like two to three foot seas, we just speed up a little bit. And that boat will plane and it's still a comfortable ride. But she worked on me for two years. So next time we cross the Gulf, we're going across daylight only, and you're going to spend <laughs> the money, big boy. And uh, so we finally agreed to do that. And uh, we came to came to a decision that's going to be the way to go. But then we ran into these friends, the Mary and Dan, and uh, they're in this little 26-foot uh, Nordic tug. And then by the time we got down to the Gulf, we had picked up another 26-foot Nordic mm -hmm. tug, a boat called Chip Ahoy. And that little boat only goes seven miles an hour. Oh, wow. And so we committed to going across with them. And so the second time we went across, instead of going fast like Claudia wanted to, we went even slower. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and for it those took us 26 miserable hours yeah. across. But, but it was one foot seas. I mean, it was a very calm, easy day across because those little boats couldn't handle it. But we... We waited for the weather. We got across, and it took us 26 hours across there. And uh, one of the reasons is because Captain Dan can't steer a straight line. And uh, so we were kind of zigzagging across, but that's okay. <laughs> but, so if some of our uh, listeners and viewers don't know Claudia, um, she has declared herself the first-class passenger on Stillwaters 2 um, and has done so for, I don't know how many tens of thousands of miles at this point, Dave, uh, that you two have. <laughs> on your travels together. But at the last rendezvous, um, one of our newer loopers who uh, loved Claudia's approach uh, presented a few of us with first class passenger team Claudia t-shirts and I wore mine for the Gulf crossing. So make sure you tell Claudia I was out there in my first class passenger t-shirt, but I was not treated like a first class passenger. <laughs> she, she actually okay saw <laughs> she saw your picture on the dock when y'all got across right, and said, yeah. hey, Dave, look at that T-shirt. <laughs> That's right. Team Claudia. <laughs> oh, yeah, we enjoyed those. Um, uh, and Miller had his on, too, by the way. If I don't know if, you, uh, if she saw yeah. that, but uh, Miller was also wearing yeah. his. Um, mm. All right. So we we covered the overnight. The third method that has gotten, you know, really a, not the attention it deserves, I think, is the big bend route, which is the multiple hops kind of going up into that bend of Florida. It's the way Solly and Jackie are going to be doing their crossing in the next few days, uh, whether whether doing what is expected, they'll be able to do that uh, starting in the next few days. So what's page four of the You Make the Call report, Dave? Tell us about the big bend information. Well, Solly, since I know y'all are looking at this a lot closer than I am because you're fixing to do it, why don't you talk, discuss it? <laughs> well, I, I think the uh, the greatest thing about what Dave's put together here is the fact of, of the points he's talking about in the, in the Big Ben. And what we do is we look at what, what our criteria is for each of those crossings going across. And so whether or not you could do it in two days or three days, and, and I take a step back here just to emphasize that 
the information is just is more than weather because David's also talking about how far it is from point B to point uh, from point B to point C, as well as from A to C. So David gives you options in this document that are very good to look at. But looking at the, the criteria of the weather going across, we're, we're looking at also the next day and the day after. Uh, of course, we may get stuck in uh, Steenhatchee or maybe even Crystal River, but we're continually looking at all four days going across, all the way from Carabelle, all the way to Tarpon Springs. And we're excited to hear how that goes um, and to hear your comparison of the straight across method that you did on your last loop um, with this one. Uh, our plans last year when we never actually did cross the Gulf had originally been to cross straight across and then take the big bend coming back to head into the rivers for the, the summer. But of mm -hmm. course, we never actually made it that far. <laughs> um, so we have not yet experienced the big bend, but, it, you know, it's it's one of those it has become one of those choices on the Great Loop that makes it a great reason to go around again um, for those things that you have to pick one or the other. Um, so I love that you and Jackie are out there doing the other <laughs> this time. That's true. And, and so we're, we're trying to do things differently, stop at different points than we did the, on our first loop. So quite naturally, we're talking about the bend. Uh, but I, I think what what's uh, what's also popped out to us and David and I when we discuss these things is how many more windows of opportunity you have on the bend which we didn't really realize at the beginning because the the mentality right off the bat is going straight across but looking at these days uh you, you just have you just have more opportunities and that's what we're looking at getting from we just pulled into port st joe this afternoon and we're looking at leaving tomorrow to go to dog island and then steinhatchee and then crystal river and then be back in tarpon springs before christmas mm -hmm. so uh it takes a little bit more logistically but the fact is is that i think you've got better weather windows in that area up in that bend there yeah well, and that's really interesting because one of the things that Eddie has presented at our rendezvous, which is hugely helpful information, is the number of uh, suitable crossing windows that he would deem suitable for his crew in his boat by month um, and how many of those were several days back to back. And it is so very few. And I think that perhaps is what dissuades people from considering the Big Bend route. So now that you and Dave have really spent some time this season studying that and can really see that the weather for that path is not the same as the weather for going straight across. So even though there weren't three viable weather windows back to back for straight across, there are for the bend. And even just our slight course change that had such a difference in our weather kind of speaks to that idea that, um, you know, looking at that one line does not necessarily speak to what up into the, the bend is doing. So um, really interesting. And it'll be nice to kind of review all of these reports kind of at the end of the season and look at the data that says, you know, this was doable. Um, it'll, and it's, yeah, it's yeah, it'll be, just, I think just it'll be interrupt there. Oh, go ahead, Solly. Well, I was just going to say, I think it'll be interesting to see if there's more people that do the big bend this year, just because of the information that David's putting out there, because it's almost like a sales tool in a way, <laughs> because we're, because we're showing, we're showing something that I think that hasn't really uh has been shown before yeah. and so i i think there's going to be a correlation between what david's document has and the number of people going that way yeah, it'll be interesting to see dave you had something on that point yeah i just wanted to build on one other thing there's another another interesting thing that's happened this year that i haven't seen in the past and is a little marina that is east of carabelle called saint mark's and i went there uh for my job, I, I can't say that all the way. So my job, and uh, <laughs> was at that uh, at that marina earlier, six weeks or so ago. And it's a neat little facility. And I asked them, I said, "How many loopers come up here?" And they said, "Oh, almost nobody." And I said, "But a long time ago, uh, before all this GPS started, you know, we said we used to get loopers in here all the time. But but you know, because as the technology increased, it made it easier to go straight across. They don't see us anymore." But this year, people are starting to go up in there uh, more, and it's really another. It's not on this report, but it's another easy way to go from Carabell and instead of going out each pass, go all the way east and go out that far end, and you can really hug the coast and then make the run up to St. Mark's. And what that really does, because from from Carabell to Steenhatchee, 
it's about 70 miles if, off the top of my head, something like that. And it's almost, you know, da daylight to daylight, you know, the sun, sunrise and sunset. But if you go up to St. Mark's, you close that gap over a third of the distance. And then the next day, again, you're just hugging the coastline, you know, from St. Mark's to Steinhatch, and you're really not in any big water at all. You know, it's shallow, mm -hmm. closer, you know, you get off, but you're not in, you know, that you're not 12, 20 miles offshore, you're much closer. And that fetch with this northeast and north winds makes that a lot much comfortable ride. Uh, so I bring that to people's attention. And the other one is when people think about the Big Bend, you know, and, and Solly mentioned there's notes in there on that page, you don't have to go every stop. You can bypass one, go to another. So, you know, we've gone overnight twice and we've gone daylight twice. But the last two times we've crossed the Gulf, we've gone to Cedar Key and anchored and then go the rest of the way the next day, all daylight. So, you know, that's another way to do all daylight crossing is is go from Carabelle to the Cedar Key, drop the hook. And as you said, it's amazing that little bit of difference in angle makes a different, a whole different experience on the water. So we've started, that's the last two times we've anchored at Cedar Key and the next day gone into Tarpon Springs. Yeah, excellent. So lots of different uh, ways to skin this cat. Yeah. I must say, I must say, <laughs> helping David is a thrill because we're both data driven. Mm -hmm. and, and just as an example, the, thanks to Nebo, these are all the numbers of all the stops of the Nebo boats that have gone in. So we're, we're tracking this as well. <laughs> oh, I love that. I'm definitely going to need that data. <laughs> <laughs> So let's take a quick break and play a message from a sponsor. When we come back, we'll just wrap up with the last page, which is the long range forecast. So we'll be back in a moment. An alternative to the high cost of brokerage and the hassle and risks of buy owner boat selling, YachtX.com makes selling your boat easy, safe, and produces better outcomes. Licensed and bonded, YachtX combines the comfort of professional advisors with the reach of multi-platform marketing and the convenience of web transaction management and escrow so your experience is second to none. Best of all, with fees of just 1.5% or less, you save 85% or more in selling costs versus traditional brokerage. Ask them about their buyer representation rebates, YachtX Rewards referral program, and Looper discounts. Voters come first at YachtX.com. Port of Aurelia in Ontario, Canada is at the center of your Canadian boater fun and the place you want to stop between the Trent and Severn waterway system to provision or simply enjoy the sunshine city where the weatherman is most often wrong. Whether it's dining, theater, casino, or museums you're after, we have it all and we're the last chance before Georgian Bay for great city fun. At Port of Aurelia, we have everything you need. We are back on the Great Loop Radio podcast. My guests today are David Fuller and Solly Bentley. Uh, Dave is a platinum looper and Solly is a gold looper working on his platinum crossing. Uh, right now he's out there on his second loop with Jackie on Compass Rose. Um, both are frequent speakers for AGLCA and we're talking about You Make the Call, which is uh, kind of the brainchild of David. Uh, Solly is helping him on a daily basis with this, but it's providing really useful data-driven information for loopers on how to easily cross the gulf uh, by making the call on the weather window that is right for you. So we've kind of walked through most of the report. What we didn't talk about very much yet is the last page, page five, which uh, every day is the look at the long range forecast. So tell us how that's put together, Dave. All right. Well, I'm using uh, Mars Weather Service basically because he puts out a 16 day um, look ahead. And so that's really where that data is coming from. And the reason it's really on there is, uh, the you know, going back to Eddie, Eddie lives in Niceville. They're on the panhandle. He typically does a, a really nice presentation on the panhandle and the stops along the way. But what ten, tends to happen is people, when they get to Mobile Bay, they start thinking about the Gulf crossing and they go to Carabelle. Uh, being a Texas boy, it kind of reminds me of cows on the windy day. They'll walk all the way to the barbed wire fence where they can't go head into the wind and then they can't go any further. And they just stand there, you know, and so uh, there's some really cool towns to visit along the panhandle. And I always remember Eddie talking all the time about take your time, uh, you know, see the sights along the way. And so for us, kind of strategy wise, what we do when we get to Mobile Bay is I start looking at the the crossing window, you know, 
And if it's, you know, when we crossed last time, uh, this time a year ago, uh, we were looking at the weather and it was going to be seven days before we could get across when we got to Orange Beach. So it I took six days to travel from Orange Beach down to Arabelle and this little bitty small jumps and saw all the little towns. There's no reason to take three or four days and just rush down there and bypass all those neat towns. So that's really kind of what the idea behind it is because you can look at it and we've got it colored, you know, kind of color coded red and yellow. So, hey, those yellows are possible dates. So when you, there's still, I think about, uh, I, I looked earlier, I think 40 or 50 boats still on the Inland Rivers and Mobile Bay. So for those 50 people, as they, as they come down, when you get down to the bottom of the bay, there's no reason to rush to Carabell. Look at that long range forecast and see, well, if it's not going to be for another week or 10 days, there's no reason to get there and sit. And uh, there's some people sitting in Carabell that have been there a week or, you know, 10 days right now. Uh, when we got there last year, when we got to Carabell, there had been people there three weeks waiting on a weather window. And you can only go look at the smallest police station once and you kind of <laughs> seen it all, you know. That's and, right. <laughs> uh, so it's really to encourage people to to look ahead and time your arrival down to Apalachicola to Carabell with a potential weather window. And that's really the intent behind it. Yeah. Well, hats off uh, to both of you. It is fabulous information. Um have you heard Dave mention his J-O-B, um, but yet he is finding time to uh, consult with Solly Daly and put together this report for Loopers seven days a week. Um, and he's been doing so for over a month now, I believe, and plans to go until what date, Dave, are you you know projecting the well, end of the crossing season? I think I'm committed to do it till the end of February for sure. And then we'll keep an eye on that new Nebo stalker tracker, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if people still need to get across, it may continue a little bit. But right now it looks like there's about, as I mentioned, about 50 boats, Mobile Bay and up, probably another 100 along the panhandle. So about 150 people that need to get across and, you know, committed to help them safely get across probably in end of February, but you know, if there's some stragglers, we'll certainly help. Them. Yeah. So uh, if anyone is wondering how they get this, you make the call report. It is posted to our forum daily, right about 4 PM Eastern time. Um, Dave puts it out there. He usually just gives a sentence or two, you know, kind of very high level overview. And then the PDF five page document we've been talking about is attached each day. Um, so you can either sign onto the website as a member and go to the forum at 4 p.m. and see it. Or if your crossing is still several days out, it will come to you in your daily email of all of the forum digest that comes in to your email box early morning. So if you're not in a hurry and you just want to take a look at it, you can get it the next morning directly to your email box. If you are planning to go very soon and you want it immediately, just log on to the website uh, 4 p.m. or later. Browse yourself to the forum and you will find you make the call right there. Um, Dave and Sally, again, uh, can't thank you both enough. This has been great information. I used it extensively as we were getting ready for our crossing as kind of our first stop in the information gathering, which I think is exactly what you designed it to do. Um, and if it didn't look good there, no need to go any further. So <laughs> thank you for shortcutting this for many of us. And for really just kind of um, giving that peace of mind to those who are new to the idea of this long of a passage. Uh, and for those going straight across, it's a long offshore passage, something a lot of people never get the experience to do, and therefore it's new and different. And thank you just for all of the time that I know is going into helping everybody get across safely. Yeah, it's a pleasure to get to do it and, and serve our fellow boaters. Absolutely. It's great to work with David. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great to work with both of you. Um, I appreciate that the really the spirit of looping is, is this kind of spirit of uh, working together and helping uh, fellow boaters. So thank you for that. Uh, and thank you for your time today with walking us through all of this. Thanks also to everyone who has watched and listened today. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Great Loop Radio podcast. Until then, safe cruising. <laughs>